just because we have a couple of minutes before we're officially due to start. If I dare to answer this question, basically all these houses, as you see them, they don't exist anymore. They, they've all gone for whatever reason. This particular one at the corner of Lamaha and Main Street, the old Sankar house has been missing for well, several years now. And that's a thousand other plot is still empty. But there's just one item, one building in Georgetown, which has disappeared for years and nobody seems to have actually replaced it with anything else. So there we are, if anybody knows the answers, do say. I guess there are colonial wooden buildings. Mm -hmm. This is a house, uh, the old Dowding house at the corner of the St. John and Dowding Street. I think Rory Westmans used to live here, and I'll, that's mm -hmm. gone as well. That went about three, four years ago. Uh, should never have gone, of course, but yeah, it's gone. So that's what that looked like in the past. And it was probably one of the largest houses in Kitty, as far as I remember, one of the largest mansion houses, quite large. And this is the house, Dr. Singh, Lamaha Street. That's gone. History. She can hear us speaking. Mute. Okay. Sorry, I'm hoping you're not seeing my screen as well. I'm trying to admit. I don't know why. My, um, sorry, there we go. Well, everybody recognizes that that's the old um, Asper Cinema at the corner of this Waterloo and Church Street. And that's a little cottage at the corner of Middle and Carmichael. That house is on the opposite side. It's actually been renovated, but that's what it looked like, say, you know, 20 years ago, 10 to 30 years ago. And this is the Dorothy King's house in Murray Street. And that's just uh, the Bishop High School on the left. That's gone too. Everybody recognizes that, but that obviously was burnt by fire, so that went, unfortunately. This house was in New Garden Street, um, facing the Georgetown Cricket Club. I think, Alison, as you probably remember, if you think that's the house that uh, Mr. Mr. Hill lived in, probably. Yes, yeah, it's Brook Hill. It was last occupied by the United Force, I think, at the time, but it, it just disappeared overnight, as far as I remember. So when when did that go? It must have gone around 2017, 18. Okay, because I think I left in left Ghana most recently in 2017, and I think it was still there. Right. When I left, but I it look at the uh, at Google now, Google Images yeah. to 2019, and it's there's just the you know it's gone. Right. Yeah. So. yeah and that was Border House. That was called Border House. That's right. We recently it's found out. Staircase. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, and welcome, uh, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us um, for this talk about early colonial Georgetown. This is the first in a series of short talks on the theme of reimagining Georgetown, reflections on the past built environment in the city. Cities and countries evolve. As they evolve, there are particular phases where change is rapid and extensive. Both our city and our country appear to be on the threshold of such a phase. So this seems a good point to reflect a little on what has gone before. Beyond a chance to learn a little of our urban history, these talks will try to show how the city met earlier phases of intense change. 
what decisions were taken, what plans were put in train, and how have they stood the test of time? For those joining us for the first time tonight, Moray House Trust is a private, non-partisan nonprofit based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Carries and I'm the Chair of Trustees at Moray House Trust and the moderator for this event. A warm Guyanese welcome to our regulars who I think are mainly on Facebook at this point. Please note that this event is being live streamed via Facebook and YouTube. If you are on Zoom and would prefer not to be visible, please turn off your video. You can do that in the bottom left of your Zoom screen. It's a great pleasure to welcome Wayne McQuatt back as a speaker. Wayne has a long-standing interest in Georgetown's architecture and gave a talk at the Trust five years ago about the work of his great-grandfather, the mid-19th century builder, John Bradshaw Sharples, J.B. Sharples. Wayne also curates the popular Wooden Architecture Guyana Heritage Group on Facebook um, and has done so for the last few years. We're going to start by showing Wayne's talk, which lasts about half an hour. Afterwards, we're going to invite some comments from uh, a few of the um, experts and those with an interest in our midst. Um, and then we're going to open the floor for questions, general questions. At this point, you'll be invited to raise your hand if you're in the Zoom audience or type your question if you're watching on another platform. Um, please keep your settings to mute unless you're asking a question. Okay, so I'm going to now try and share the recording, uh, which as I said, will last about half an hour. We all carry memories of Georgetown we have grown up with or lived with, building streets, mostly agreeable memories. And looking back, we can mostly recollect what it was like, but what was the city really like beyond our own living experience? The origins of Georgetown. We leave behind the detail of early 18th century colonial settlement by the Dutch and French in Demerari. Suffice to say that Georgetown's beginnings as a town is unique in its evolution from the early European colonial plantations. The Dutch officially ceded to the British all territorial claims to the colonies in 1814. British influence was pervasive and in a move to stamp their identity on the country, they renamed the town Stabrook, Georgetown, after the reigning British monarch King George III which was on May the 5th, 1812. Mention here should be made of the earliest Amerindian settlements in this area, which is in the vicinity where it now stands um, St. Andrew's Kirk and Brickdown. The indigenous people were compelled to survive the impact of European colonization by retreating further into the hinterland of the country. It's interesting to see a very early 19th century sketch of Stabrook which shows the location in Brick Dam. This is just about where St. Stanislaus College is now located. We see depicted a small encampment of indigenous people in the foreground within a panorama of a town with its colonial buildings and people going about their business. Stabrook originally consisted of not much more than a two kilometer strip of land with rows of houses following a single brick road. This extended eastwards from the Demerara River to its vicinity, and the former plantations of Joseph Border, where the Botanic Garden was laid out in 1878. The Brick Road became known as Brick Dam, which continued to be one of Georgetown's major thoroughfares. Any plans to change the nomenclature of Brick Dam would be tampering with the colonial history of Georgetown's built environment. The upsurge in commercial activities and trade resulted in several important mercantile firms being established in Stavrook. The town was extended along the river, incorporating a number of former plantations 
as it began to spread outward. By 1912, the town had expanded eastwards and northwards to eight wards. Georgetown at this time encompassed an area extending from Kingston in the north to All Boys Town in the south, and the track eastward from Demerara River to Camp Street. Several of the small towns, such as Cummingsburg, Robstown, Newtown, appeared in between. Kingston and Working Rust therefore became wards or districts in the newly named town. Within Georgetown, the wards of Newtown, Robstown and Working Rust were perhaps the most deplorable condition. They were covered with shanties belonging to the poorer classes, between which ran dangerous cramped alleys. These areas were developed in the second half of the 19th century when we see a vigorous building program. This resulted in the construction of our major government and institutional buildings, like the town hall and the law courts, eh, which were done roughly around the 1870s, all now part of the colonial built heritage. The town also boasted residential districts in the suburbs, almost two miles in circumference. They were neatly laid out into large and convenient lots. The houses were in direct contrast to those in Robstown. They were large and well built on solid brick foundations, each having its own garden. Many of these large wooden houses still exist. Some are no longer in private, private dwellings, but are reused for government offices and other institutional buildings. So more must be done to preserve their status in Georgetown's rich architectural history. So today, tourists arriving in Guyana are more likely to regard Georgetown as a staging post before going beyond into the hinterland. Early visitors and writers to the early, in the early 19th century and other hand travelers and sojourned at a slower pace and had more time to absorb and reflect upon the environment and the city of Georgetown in which they found themselves. Yeah, the wooden buildings of the city that emerged in the 19th century did not go unnoticed. Um, various European writers stuck, uh, looked at the local buildings, reported back, and then we, of course we had um, Charles Waterton, who was probably one of the most famous naturalists, who was writing way back in the time of 1804. And um, most of the people who visited um, Ghana during the later part of the 19th century obviously read their Waterton before going there, so it gave them a kickstart as to what the city was like. And then we had somebody who calls himself a landowner in 1853. There again, he was talking about uh, Georgetown being the pretty little town in the West Indies. The most striking object is a lofty lighthouse and then the town itself, laid out with wide streets or roads intersecting each other at right angles, perfectly level and well macadamized. Also a collection of villas that were in the town. And then Henry Dalton, historian again, writing going back to Stabrook, um, you know, describes the streets and the houses that near them along Brick Dam. And then, of course, we had uh, Richard, the Schomburg brothers, it was Richard, uh, Robert and Richard. Richard, obviously, he came in 1841. And um, as soon as he arrived in Georgetown, the first thing he ran up to the top of the lighthouse and had a look across the city. And he had this wonderful panorama came into view, a thick forest of masts and flying flags. Spreading itself before my gaze was a city with nice and godly painted houses. It's it overtopping churches and public buildings thousands and thousands of slender palms, its broad busy streets with many canals that run through it like many veins. And this particular sketch was done by somebody who would come to a later, uh, Melton Pryor. And we also have Robert Schoenberg who came obviously early before his brother. And he was obviously the person who, you know, probably well known in his writings and his work on the boundaries of Ghana. And he gives us a peek into some of the houses he encountered in Georgetown. You know, the chief requirement of a comfortable residence naturally consists of giving ventilation as much as scope as possible. So he gives us some idea of what the houses were like in terms of their fenestration and what they were like in terms of their physical appearance. We had Evelyn Waugh, who was quite disappointed having traveled a great distance and have discovered at the end of his journey a well laid out garden city. And then his brief encounter with Georgetown, I believe he actually lived somewhere in a house in Brickdam, I think if I remember rightly from the book, um, pictured the place small and solid like a town in St. Helena. 
Instead, it was made of wood and very large. The houses all stood in their own grounds. And then, of course, Michael Swan, who has, has so much to say about Gael and his marches, Belderado, and where he describes, I think it was mainly Main Street in particular, where the nights, the night air of Georgetown is cool and moves with an unceasing northeast trade winds, which temper the humidity. To walk in the streets at night is to feel intensely the luxury, the unreality of the tropics. So when it comes to setting the historic and architectural framework of all the above, we can rely on two gentlemen, Father Ignatius Scholes, the architect priest, and James Rodway, the naturalist, historian, and writer. They were both Georgetown residents and they weren't just expatriate birds of passage. Their writings have left us the records not only with how they perceived the built environment at the time, but give us a context for imagining for ourselves in how it may have appeared at that particular time. Ignatius Scholes. When it comes to the 19th century architectural history of Georgetown buildings, it is the Reverend Scholes that we turn. Ignatius Scholes first came to British Guard in 1868 as a Catholic priest and spent six years. He returned again in 1880 and lived here until his death in July 1896. Scholes was a qualified architect, like his father, and was also a self-taught painter and a writer. His name has become known to us through his architecture of the City Hall. Scholes' winning design for the building was by competition which he entered anonymously. His early contribution to ecclesiastical architecture in Ghana was the interior decoration of St Mary's Cathedral on Bricktown, unfortunately destroyed by fire in 1913. Scholes designed the pulpit, the marble high altar, the sanctuary and other internal features. He also designed the metal shrine to the Virgin Mary which was placed on the topmost pinnacle of the steeple. The statue survived its fall during the fire of 1913 and is now placed high above the western entrance to the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception of Breakdown. As a contemporary observer in the 1880s, Scholes wrote one of the earliest architectural texts where he commented on the public buildings that graced Georgetown. His essay, The Architecture of Georgetown, was published in 1885. Here he presents his personal and critical views of the buildings which he encountered. He was forthright in pointing out what he thought was good architecture and aesthetic design, and made his views clear about the building's styles which he did not which did not meet his criteria. Reverend Scholes' missionary work with the poor kept him busy with his instruction classes and visits to homes. He contributed articles to the local newspaper, some of which were later reissued in a book form in 1885 with the title Sketches of African and Indian Life in British Guyana. It is through these descriptive reports of his that we hear about the houses of the poorer classes living in Georgetown. Areas like Lacey Town in the mid-19th century had shanty housing, and it's in these areas east of High Street where clearance was made for the buildings like the Town Hall, which were opened in 1888. So from his sketches of African and Indian life, we get a description of the humbler type of dwelling. Scholes writes, The African's house is certainly built to live in, not to be looked at. The houses were all built of wood, like Noah's Ark of old. They are built of wood simply because there is neither stone nor brick nor lime out there to build them. The framework of the building is formed of hardwoods like colony, Bolivar, green heart or mora, though pitch pine for that purpose is now finding a ready market. The frame of the small edifice outside is squared upright, some five to seven feet apart, mortised into the sill. Wooden steps lead up to the door, generally in front of the building. And very poignantly, he adds, no knocker is there, much less a bell. James Rodway. The last word on the old Georgetown will always go to James Rodway. On September 26th, 1870, James Rodway arrived in British Guyana and instantly fell in love with the city and lived there until his death in 1926. Rodway was a botanist and naturalist and a fellow of the Linnaean Society. Before his arrival in British Guyana, had already read Waterton's Wanderings in South America 
and was looking forward to seeing tropical America. Robbie was not only a naturalist, but also a historian and antiquary. His descriptions of the growth of the city during the period of residence, therefore, are made up from his personal observations. Robbie tells us much more about Georgetown, how it evolved physically in terms of streets, canals, gardens and open spaces. We are also given much history that relates, relates to the city government. Eventually, he would record the stark realities of the story of Georgetown in such a manner that it remains unmatched in the annals of our literature. The story of Georgetown was published in book form in 1920. It was revised from a series of articles first published in the Argosy newspaper in 1903. As an example for our reimagining the past, Rodway takes us back to his green walks along the path of coffee plantation Vicingen with rows of trees. Here we can realise that this was the avenue of the Botanic Garden which was laid down in 1878. Do we also realise that the lands of the former railway terminus at Lamahal Street were once the burial grounds of Stabrook? So anyone who enjoys Georgetown and is conscious of his past can't fail to find interest in Rodway's story. It's hard to imagine Georgetown completely denuded of greenery. By most accounts, late 19th century and early 20th century Georgetown was beautiful. Located where the Demerara River meets the Atlantic Ocean, it was a city of steadily blowing ocean breezes, flower-filled canals, wide tree-lined boulevards and whitewashed houses on stilts surrounded by flowering gardens. From the towers of the houses, one can see a collection of houses, churches, public buildings embowered in foliage and surrounded with palms. The trees are so numerous, wrote Henry Dalton, that the city appears to be situated in a forest, nearly every building being isolated from its neighbour and having a collection of shrubs or a garden. But Georgetown in the Stabrook period was not always embowered in foliage. Henry Bolingbroke, writing at the end of the Dutch period in Stabrook in 1811, says, There are no trees in the streets as in Holland. The town would have been pleasanter with this institution of the old country. However, by the middle of the 19th century, we find early sketches of the city with native palm trees. The palm trees at the head of Lusingen Road at the end of Bricktown date from the 1830s. By the 1850s, there were plans to fill the canals such as Main Street, but formal tree planting came much later. As for formal public gardens, the Promenade Gardens was laid out in Cummingsburg in the, by the Town Council in 1853. This gave an impetus to ornamental planting with trees and shrubs imported from Trinidad Botanic Gardens. Broadway tells us that ornamental trees were hardly known in the early times, but fruit trees were plentiful, many of these being remnants of the former plantations like Borders for St. John Plantation, which he visited before it was transformed into the Botanic Garden in 1878. James Broadway also mentioned an avenue of mahogany trees in Le Pinter Cemetery from 1870. These ancient trees have somehow survived in the wilderness that is now Le Pinter. The cemetery parkland has been neglected over the decades by the City Council. It's an area of Georgetown that has so much potential to be maintained as an inner-city in woodland and memorial garden, while yet re re retaining its plantation history. The once lofty palms of Lerabeter have mostly lost their crowns and no longer hold their majesty. The salmon trees in the St. John Road planted a little later in the 1880s have mostly survived and still provide a shady canopy. But do we ever see saplings planted to fill the older trees as they disappear? These empty spaces along the avenues where once stood trees have become more evident, Main Street in particular. For another 19th century commentary on the city, there is Henry Kirk who was more resident than a mere visitor. Kirk served for 25 years as Sheriff of Essequibo Demerara from 1872. 
Hence the title of his memoir of his life in British Guyana, which called 25 Years in British Guyana, which was published in 1898. His reminiscences meander through a variety of topics, including houses and tree-lined streets. To quote him, Georgetown, the capital of British Guyana, the Venice of the West Indies, as it had been called, is certainly a strange place, and one calculated to excite the interest and admiration of everyone. End quote. And when one thinks of Venice, we associated it with canals, of course, and Georgetown had many in its own modest form. At least Kirk is able to describe what existed in this time, and we can reimagine how Main Street appeared in the mid-19th century. Henry Kirk writes again, Main Street is certainly the prettiest little street I ever saw, about 40 yards wide. It's divided up the middle by a wide canal full of Victoria Regia lily. The canal and the roads on each side being shaded by an avenue of salmon trees. Handsome houses painted white or some bright colour built on each side of the trees, nearly all of which are surrounded by gardens full of croton palms. Then there was Richard Schomburg, a visitor in 1841 to Georgetown, who describes his rented accommodation in Cummingsburg as, quote, a pretty little house situated in Camp Street, surrounded by slender palms and plenteously shaded foliage trees, with its cool, airy gallery and its widely projected roof, satisfactory from every point of view. End quote. The Camp Street Canal was later populated with Victoria Regia lilies, fitting a quartet tribute to his brother Robert. Robert Schomburg in 1837 discovered the Amazonian lily, or the Victoria Regia as we know it, which he found growing in Burpees. The Promenade Garden had already been established in 1853. From here on, there appears to be a more scientific professional approach to agriculture and horticultural matters. The Royal Agricultural Society was founded in 1844. And there was a resolution passed by the Society in April 1877 that established the Botanic Garden in 1878. The head gardener, John Waby, was appointed in 1879. Then Samuel Genman arrived in 1880 to take up the position as government botanist and superintendent of the Botanical Garden in Georgetown. He was trained at Kew Gardens in England. He lived in Castellani House, which was newly built in 1879, and he remained there until his death in 1902. The Botanical Garden was developed from the abandoned plantation Lusingen, formerly owned by the Dutch planter Joseph Borda. When Genman arrived in Georgetown in 1879, the Botanical Gardens was just an eye day. By the time he died 23 years later, he had transformed Guyana's capital city with orderly and pleasant greenery and created one of the best public gardens in the British colonies. The main roadway you now see passing through the Botanical Gardens was once the central canal of Joseph Borders plantation. To fill that canal, Genman dug a lake nearby for the necessary earth. He dug several other lakes to obtain earth for secondary roads and also to raise the level of the gardens. His preference really was for more natural planting. George Genman's urban tree planting also changed the face of Georgetown and left a lasting imprint on the city. From 1888, Genman started planting avenues of trees along the main roads, and many of which are still standing today. The giant salmon trees you pass beneath the Vicentian Road were planted under his direction. His far-sighted plans for more urban vegetation were hampered by the appearance of overhead electrical wires. Genman has suggested the wires be run on the ground, but this suggestion was ignored by the authorities. His success in establishing the botanical gardens led the town council to offer him to undertake the care and maintenance of the promenade gardens. Another idea of his was to lay out a small garden in front of Stabrook Market before he died in 1902, but the town councillors blocked his plan. A century later, the vicinity around Stabrook Market continues to be chaotic 
and cries out for sustainable urban regeneration planning to exclude and include the environment, tree planting and pedestrian walkways. So for many Guyanese, the garden city ideology has been seductive. The perception of Georgetown as a garden city still prevails in the psyche of many Guyanese. Their memories of streets shaded by flowering trees, flamboyant or tropical shrubs. While the city is not completely denuded of trees, it has certainly lost much of its original ornamental planting from the 19th century with little replacement of fallen trees. Apart from the people who wrote about Gann, there are obviously people who sketched and took photographs. So this is just a quick summary of some of the things that, um, you know, what we come across. Joshua Bryant was obviously quite an interesting artist and a writer as well, because he presents us with some very Arcadian views of Gann and the plantations. This one here, you see the Kitty Frontlands. And at the same time, he was the person who recorded the, um, the rebellions of the slaves at the time. So we get pictures of these Arcadian uh, pleasantries. And at the same time, he gives us the raw life of what was going on around him in 19, 1823. The other person was um, Melton Pryor. He was an English artist and war correspondent who worked for the Illustrated London News. Um, he was very sort of privileged because he was allowed to travel around with the army at the same time. So he was under the ages of the British government when he traveled. And he did lots of pencil sketches and sent them back to London where they were redrawn by studio artists and engraved on wood blocks. And they were normally printed in the Saturday issues of the Illustrated London News. And here we can see some familiar ones where he drawn Georgetown, these rather hilarious looking sketches of mainly people in different sort of costume, different postures. And this is the one of High Street and we have the hand in hand and the post office tower and the assembly hall here. And this is the one of Central Water Street where we can see the post office, well, RACS tower here. So we're looking north, towards north in um, Water Street. But at the same time, we were, uh, as photography came in, one having a visual impact and something to look at visually. Um, C.B. Norton, um, we don't know exactly who he was, but he produced an album. So when viewed through the eyes of the camera, old Georgetown gave an appearance of serenity and grace, an Arcadian paradise in the tropics. This aspect can be, uh, we can appreciate from a selection of photographs of the city of Georgetown as approaches to the Demerara River taken by C.F. Norton that was published in 1870. And then later on in the 20th century, we have um, A.S. Hitchcock. So we move forward to the 1920s where we have albums of monochrome photographs by Alfred Spears Hitchcock. Uh, Hitchcock himself was also a botanist and his photographs of the century ago visually document Georgetown, the Garden City, which as much as emphasize, emphasis on fruit bearing trees like the breadfruit and star apple trees. Uh, this, these are some of the views from Norton's album, really, which um, I think some of them are quite familiar. Most of them date from about 1980, sorry, 1870. This particular one here, you can see where the empty plot where the Hand in Hand building has not been erected yet. Hand in Hand was actually put in 1878. So it gives you an idea of you know, the photograph was taken earlier than that time anyway. So we have a view looking down North Street there with the old Beckwith Hotel and assembly rooms. And then across here we have uh, Main Street looking north. And there's a view here of Stabrook, which includes St Andrew's Church, looking in very pastoral sort of um, surroundings. And in the background, the public buildings. And then Carmichael Street looking south. Um, but the wide landscape, we've got the old St. George's Cathedral here. That's the one, the stone built cathedral before it, was, before it was taken down. And we have what was the Queen, New Queen's College building, which obviously then became <clears> the <throat> site of the Bishop's High School. So that gives us an image where we can now recreate more or less what it's like today. And that was 1870, that's more than a century ago. So we come to some of the 1920s photographs of um, Spears, sorry, of Hitchcock. And his main interest was really photographing the trees of Georgetown. And it gives us a very interesting selection. This, for example, is a star apple tree. And on the corner of High Street here, we get this frangipani tree here. 
And obviously, the Palm Hotel, Greg and what would be then the old Tau Hotel Main Street. And this is a photograph of Main Street looking down towards Hope Street. In the distance, we have St. Thomas's Church. And this is the detail of that star apple tree growing in the centre of Main Street, um, which you wouldn't really expect to find uh, now, because you find obviously trees, but not necessarily fruit trees. But going back is very interesting because when people talked about trees early in the time of Stabrook, apparently there were lots of fruit trees still left over from the plantations. So one had a natural, in a way we had regular planting done in the city. They were the odd fruit trees that actually went back to the old plantation days. And just ending that section by well, everybody knows Anthony Trollope, who pretty much you know his visit to Georgetown in his role of postmaster general. He stayed at the hotel called Clarendon. He described a, a rickety, ruined, tumble-down wooden house into which, at first, absolutely dreads enter lest the steps should fail. All houses in Georgetown are made of wood and therefore require a good deal of repair. And not uncommon heard it today about Georgetown wooden buildings. So. Over a century and a half later, our wooden buildings in Georgetown are still in peril. However, there has been some recent high profile efforts to restore and sustain our wooden heritage. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, yeah. A couple of the, the 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 things that strike you immediately, I think, um, are that we are still enjoying trees that were planted a hundred and fifty years ago. Um, it, it, it's like it, 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 that. With, that was one of the things when we were doing this that 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 struck me the most is that you know some something that someone did 150 years ago has really shaped Georgetown in ways that we're still enjoying. Um, and uh, I wondered if um, I'd like to invite a couple of comments before we open the floor um, for questions. Um, I wondered if we could just explore that particular theme for a moment. I'm going to invite um, Alison Stoll to kick off with uh, any thoughts she has on that. Um, uh, Ali. Do. Thanks, Isabel. I think it's remarkable that anything survived at all. I mean, you know, trees, not to mention, uh, and at, at the rate we're going. But let me first start by saying that, Wayne, this is excellent. I think you held it together, you pulled it out together there, and just a really informative and visually stimulating uh, way that, um, you know, only you can do. And I really, really enjoyed how you moved. Um, you know, chronologically as well as sort of, um, you know, laterally with all the uh, the plantings as well as the buildings. I, I hope we can see this again because, you know, I, I mean, certain things stuck out. Uh, one of the, one of the um, early writers spoke about gaudy, gaudy houses in Georgetown. Gaudily painted. <laughs> gaudily painted? I mean, white is a gaudy color? <laughs> no, because they were the colored, the colored roofs, something? wouldn't they? The, the roofs would have been all different colors, wouldn't they, from that period? But I don't know that we would have been seeing roofs at, at that time in these huge houses. I mean, it's not like we, we have, uh, you know, regular um, drones overhead now. No, no, but all, all all the visitors went up uh, up to the top of the lighthouse, didn't they? To, and and that's where the god god there. would have come from, uh, way. I don't know. That's but, but that the, puzzled the, me a bit. The police station was painted grey. I think schools call it dove, dove grey, French grey, which you could approve now. So some buildings must have had some colour. Because really. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking at. Maybe State House is a bright green, is it? That's, and I thought that was quite gaudy. 
<laughs> I think I think we've always had strong colors. Um, yeah. And and uh, in in that towards the end, there's um there's a building that had very interesting fenestration, uh, like Demerara shutters, but they weren't coming. They weren't hinged at the top. They seemed to be coming out. Uh, they seemed to be hinged at the middle and coming out at an angle. And that mm. had the Demerara shutters were all um, a very dark color. Um, so yeah, I, I think there was probably more color than me. Than we thought. Than we realize, yeah. yes. Um, and yes, it will be available. It'll be up on YouTube and Facebook. So there'll be plenty of opportunity to uh, review. To go back and, and take it all in. Yeah. Excellent, excellent presentation. Excellent research. And I, can I just say, it's all very well having a summary like that, but the joy is actually reading the texts. Because when you read the texts, <laughs> you get back into the whole yeah. <laughs> Yes, I mean that. That's you're 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 hopefully you're you're trying to sort of send us in that direction, aren't you, to go and dig out our our Rodways and um, uh, and Schombergs and, and so on. Um, the other thing that 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 was very striking, I think, was the canals. Um, and I would like I, as I understand it, we had a lot more canals at mm. one point than we do now. I'm going to just invite Bert Carter to come in here because I know that canals are a subject that are uh, close to his um, close to his heart. <laughs> so, and he's actually spoken at Moria House about them on more than one occasion. So Bert, am I right in thinking that we have that we had a, 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 a considerable shrinking of our canals um, and that maybe that's happened again since? Yes, in fact, if I could just give a brief history about what I consider to be the drainage pattern in British Guiana and in Guiana today is we have three main rivers that flow from south to north. All of our rivers in Guiana flow from south to north, except one river, which is the Iring River, which flows from north to south. But all our, canal, our creeks flow from east to west or west to east because they meet in the respective rivers and all flow to the ocean. So there's a macro view of the drainage pattern. Now, believe it or not, if a drop of rain falls in Mount Rorai, outside of Mount it has to come all the way down there, skip it before it reaches the ocean, you know. Unless it evaporates or turn absorbs into the ground. But the truth is, there's a macro view. A micro view would be when Governor Graves Andy was in office, he had canals number one and two built dug in the West, West Bank of the Murrow. There's also a canal number three that people don't know about. This is the one that runs uh, in an east west direction, just next to the Moka Road by the police station in Providence. That's canal oh, number three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh. Anyway, yeah, and then we come to the city of Georgetown where we have all these canals running most, more or less from east to west and they flow into the uh, Demara River. They are controlled by 13 outlets, 13 cocos or sluices, as we say. Interesting to know that the word coco doesn't appear in the English dictionary, nor does the word telling. I never knew that until recently. Both words don't appear in the Dutch. Anyway. These, these 30 cocos, some of them have pumps now. There are roughly 10 pumps that have been installed at each one of these cocos to be able to drain the city. And they need the pumps because they fill in most of the canals. All the main canals, which was from Michael Street, Main Street, Main Street, Michael Street, Waterloo Street, Camp Street, Thomas Street, East Street, were all canals that flow in the north south direction of south north, depending on which half. If, if you live north of Middle Street, Everything flowed in an early direction. We flowed south, everything flowed in southerly direction. So we filled in all those, and literally we filled in Merriman's Canal, which is now Merriman's Promenade, and the Politicist's X Street Canal. So we, we surrendered a lot of our storage capacity. And in fact, as Chris Bell pointed out, when I did a study at the presentation at Morehouse, House, I did some calculations to establish that one and a half inch of rain, four to 10, four hours, could have been stored in all those canals. So now that we don't have that capacity, they all appear on the streets. <laughs> Everybody gets their ankle wet, you know. Sometimes if you're unlucky, you have most of your knees wet. In 2005, we had a terrible, terrible flood, which is one of the worst floods I noticed in my, in my lifetime. And uh, that's because we had the overtopping of the conservancy canal. You believe the dam broke, but the dam didn't really break. The dam just, uh, just uh, the rain just fell and overtopped the canal. And we see some beautiful pictures there, uh, Alice, on the screen. Mm, yes. Mm. I was looking for the canal that you were mentioning. Um, 
and I I found it. So canal yeah. number one, canal number two. Uh huh. Yeah. They did, they did, they did. Dog by Grace Andy. Mm hmm. Yes, mm. fascinating. Um. So. Can I ask? Can I ask Bart a question, Isabel? Oh, do please go ahead. <laughs> um, why were there no cocos on the East Coast before you get to Hope? There was no coca at Kitty. There was no coca along the coast. All the cocos were on the river. Well, that's, that's true. It's not totally true. If I, you find a lot of cocos, you find them at places like Better Hope, Triumph, <laughs> LBA. You know, wherever the planters had choking, they needed the drainage. If you tell but me that, there's no there, there's no cocoa from hope until you reach my head, yes, I agree with that. But, there's no but cane planted up. There was none, there was no cocos for Georgetown <laughs> all along the wall. All the cocos were in the river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, very true. And I don't know why they were not there, but I can tell you what there, there, there are no cocos between Kitty mm -hmm. and uh there were some cocoa between Kitty and as far as, oh gosh, behave, behave, behave. But after mm -hmm. behave, which is slightly east of it, more, there are no more cocoa until you reach Mahiko, because there's no planting by the planters in cane, cane product. Nobody planted cane. If there was no cane to be planted, it would be reaped. There's no, no interest in having drainage. Yeah, because uh, I think the cotton, the cotton cultivation could um, survive in some amount of saline water. Some, some amount of sea water, but the sugar, no. Mm -hmm. And you remember uh, Ivleri and Kitty, which was a sugar plantation in, I think up to 1840s, had already been abandoned. Um, mm -hmm. So there was no need and who would pay for it too? Exactly. So yeah. we have a question actually in the feed saying who filled the canals? Was it the British? No, well, I'd have to say to some extent, yes, because as a child growing up in Georgetown, I, moved, I started living in Georgetown in 1950. At that time, Main Street was filled in, Michael Street was filled in, Waterloo Street was filled in, Camp Street. The only one that wasn't filled in was East Street. East Street was filled in after about 1959. And I started uh, about to leave high school here. And my mom's going to have a fill in after I left England in 1961. And so what about? Go on. Street. Sorry. Thomas Sorry? Street. Thomas Street of the of the five main street, you know, Carmichael, Waterloo, Camp, East, and mm -hmm. Thomas Street. That was also filled in. Same time. Yeah, yeah I think well, I can't be I think they were all filled in. Certainly not I don't I can't vote at the same time. Really there's no documentation I've ever come across. But I know they filled up before I came to Georgetown. In 1950, when I came to Georgetown, they were all filled in already. So they must be filled in something before then. Bert, Bert, I want to ask a question. Do you think mm -hmm. um, opening them up again, like redigging them, would help flooding in the city of Georgetown? Well, if we were to ex excavate at least, let's say, maybe not Main Street, but maybe, I don't know, the expendable ones, uh, Thomas Street, I think, Michael. I don't think any really expendable, but the truth is, <laughs> If we, were, if we didn't give up surrender our culture of maintenance, what we have in, in the ground right now, I think could work, you know. Guess why? I really don't feel that our culture of maintenance is lost this way. And people go and dig, every weekend they dig in the dam canal, nobody digging under the bridges. So you got this reservoirs between bridges. You know, nobody goes in. Mm -hmm. And in 1994, mm -hmm. Dr. Jagan had 19 people who formed the IMC, Internal Management Committee of the City. Myself, Benny Sankar, uh, Tony Shavir and another guy, Mr. Moore, so I forget his name, Sir Christian, you know. Anyway, the four of us formed Ambish Pandi, the, the works committee. And we entirely, we cleaned the entire city. And then in fact, after that, there's a long time between then when the next flood. The truth is, I think the maintenance culture, if it were to be maintained, if it were to be delivered, would help the city a lot. I don't think we should go back and open the canals, really. And they were mainly, there's a question in the feed saying, were they for 
um, for drainage or transport or recreation. They were, of course, originally mainly for drainage, were they? I, well, yes, I think that'd be right. That'd be very right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although there are interesting possibilities, thinking of the canals generally, like with the, the sugar estates and so on, of maybe uh, them doubling up or the, the, the sugar estates that are now defunct, those canals being used for, um, for recreational purposes or um, ornamental or, or something rather than, you know, just being allowed to be overrun by weeds. <laughs> Um, uh, I think part of the problem is that canals per se. I think uh, the alleyways, the, inter the internal alleyways between the blocks, those, those need to be cleaned. I mean, if you were the one that's just east of Amori House, I don't know where the hell is uh, the thing that's more bush in it than you got in the Kramer Forest. <laughs> you know, and, and, and probably more thing. wildlife too. I was just <laughs> going to say they got some big commodity in them alleyways. <laughs> yeah, and the truth is, if you, if you walk down all, all the alleyways, you'll find that there's a big problem, you know, unless the water can reach the main drains, it's going away fast. And so it just blocks up the smaller drains. The internal drains are smaller. They get blocked up much easier than water floods over the road. And so we have another question in the feed saying that um, uh, the pollution culture has also contributed to the high incidence of flooding. Since we can't depend on the population to change their behaviors, wouldn't it be best to find alternatives such as paving over the drains and placing trap nets to catch the debris? So this yeah. is talking about the, 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 this is saying that so some of the problem is, and it is, I think, litter is a, is a significant problem. I mean, even if we mm -hmm. maintain the drains beautifully. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful about covering over the drains because if you don't clean them, we see them, we... I think nobody ever came what they don't see, you know. That was so me. So the styrofoam ban didn't make much of a difference, did it? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It's still, some of it's still around, you know. Some of it's yeah. still around. Plastic straws and things like that. I should say, if anyone has any questions, please do jump in or, or uh, raise your hand. We're a small enough group. You can just jump in, I think. Um, uh, and I'm looking at the um, the ones in the feed. Where am I? Uh, very interesting question here. Sorry, I'll just take this one from the feed and then over to you, Alison. Um, given, given the constant intrusion of the ocean and the climate change challenges, is Georgetown sustainable as the capital? Hmm. I'd, like to, I'd like to jump over that. In fact, I'm a strong advocate that I think it's about time we start thinking about moving the city. Moving the city inland. In fact, there's a study done by a German company paid for by the World Bank that shows if you move the city up towards slightly south of Artico, and we'd have everything we would have a quarry that we need right there. We'd have all the water in the three rivers, and the land is higher than the surrounding water level, you know, about 12, 15 feet above sea level. I really think we should be moving in phases, you know, really. Um, Wayne, would you like to come in on that? Um, any thoughts? Well, then Georgetown would be like a real Venice in that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it feels as though Georgetown is being, is in danger of being asked to fill a lot of different purposes right now. Um, and it may be that if you, as, as many other, I think Brazil did that, didn't they, with Brasilia? Um, and, and many other countries have, you know, designated an administrative capital, um, mm -hmm. which is where you would do your sort of your your modern building, if you like, and, and, and all that kind of thing and concentrate, you know, your architecture, your modern architecture, maybe in some of your infrastructure and, the, and then give George Shauna a little ease with that. It seems to me that we're trying to make it everything at the moment, you know, um, uh, and we might end up with nothing because obviously, <laughs> as you say, the climate change is, is a problem. Um, Alison, did you want to come in on that? I saw you nodding vigorously. No, I, I was just, uh, I, I was kind of thinking of, along those lines that, um, you know, at some point, at least as the administrative center of a growing um, 
I don't want to say metropolis, but I'm looking at the, the Pegasus skyline there and, and the Marriott. Mm -hmm. I think at some point we're going to have to move some of these functions out of the current um, area if, if we want to have, um, you know, real sustainable development because you can't be, um, you know, looking every time it rains, you have to worry about flooding in five or 10 minutes. It's, it's really not sustainable. And we're going to have to do something about that. And I think it was uh, Jay, I'm, I'm, I'm lost on his last name. I, I remember going to a talk at the Pegasus Hotel where he, he was really seriously advocating for at least some of the administrative um, functions of the city to be moved. And I think we ignore such exhortations at our peril. We have to seriously be thinking about it, which means that we have to conceptualize a plan. You know, we have to start doing surveys of where we want to be, um, because at some point somebody's going to take this seriously. Maybe not past and present governments, but um, in future, I think the wisdom of at least moving some of the functions of our city um, out of harm's way. Mm. I'm going to invite, sorry, Susan Alsop's been waiting very patiently to ask her question. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, it's slightly off of buildings, but um, it's probably more directed towards Wayne. He made reference to uh, 25 Years in British Guyana, which is a lovely book, which, um, which I have in my father's study. But um, I wondered if what history he has on uh, uh, government house, the, the the house that the president lives in, I, that was part of his presentation. And I was just interested because I really don't know what the history of that house is. I do know Castellani house was built, was designed by the Italian architects, Mr. Castellani. And I had known that prior to his presentation, but I was just interested in the president's house as it is on Main Street. And a second question for maybe someone who has um, interest in botany. Um, also, why were all of the houses in Georgetown painted white on the wood, painted white? There were wooden houses. Was there some technical reason why most of them were painted white? as well as the trees. The trees are painted white from the ground to about, huh, about four feet up. Is there a, a botanical reason for that? Is it to stop some kind of termites or some kind of ants from crawling? I'm sure it's more than just cosmetic. Whoever can respond is welcome. Wayne, would you like to the president's house in Main Street. The history goes back, it's probably built by Sandbach Park for the Sandbach Park Company originally, but there again, we don't know the exact dates and who built it. And then after Sandwich Park, I think it became a booker's house, I believe. And then the government took it over from that respect. But that's, that's a rough history in terms of the chronology of people who live there. But like most of the houses in Georgetown, we really don't know the, we know about the public buildings, but we really don't know who built most of the, um, the other larger houses. So right. that helped. And is that because our archives don't have the information or were, was that destroyed by fire? Why, why is it that we don't know? Because the British were excellent record keepers. I'm sure the records are there somewhere. My disadvantage is I don't live in Guyana, so I can't do searching directly. For the last couple of months, I haven't been able to go to Kew because of the COVID to actually search because the records do exist somewhere, but it's just reading, reading, reading to find them. I see. But as you said, I think the archives in Guyana are pretty poor. And you think that's the place to start, but it's not necessarily. I think people like Alison probably know more sources in terms of getting back to the basic plans. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where we, we somebody really needs to concentrate on going back to the beginning, to really looking to see from scratch how these buildings were actually put together. I see. Uh, may I interrupt you there, Wayne? Two, two seconds. Yes, go ahead, Bert. I think Wayne might be a little confused between the Prime Minister's building on Main Street, which is built by Protestants and indeed known by Bookers. I think, but what uh, Susan is interested in government house, the one that, yeah, that government is supposed house. to live in. That mm -hmm. was built in 1852 under the hospital of government Barclay. And in fact, Castellani thought it was one of the worst pieces of architecture in Georgetown because they had a piece and piece, we sing a piece, piece and piece and piece on top. You know, it has yes. very poorly designed building. And I think I it, to some extent is right. In fact, the only thing that was beautiful in there was the, the stable, which is Castellani's design. There's a stable in the compound that Castellani himself designed and it is uh, it's worth looking at. And the which building is now, itself which is now the barracks. Hmm? Which, is now, which is now what they call the barracks, where the uh, the, the presidential the, the, guards hang out. 
Yeah, I think I think that's what they call yeah. it now, yes. But what's interesting about that particular property, and when President Grange got into the office, finally the compound was flooded. And he asked me where they could go and look at it. So I looked at it and told him the truth. I don't think anybody liked the truth, but the truth is every piece of property north of Middle Street drains in a northerly direction to the Lamar Street Canal, and everything south of Middle Street drains in a southerly direction to Church Street Canal. Now, if you think about it, all the blocks have an alleyway running in the middle, some running east to west, some running north to south. Those in common borders run north to south. And in fact, in government house, as, as this, you would have it, half of the property extends into Middle Street. So if you look at the property from New Market Street end, the alleyway that runs in the north to south direction really doesn't do justice because the property is so big. And then you have the two, you have the prominent gardens and you have the, the uh, Independence Park, both of which are supposed to have alleyways and don't have any. So all the water that runs out just pours into this property. You know, so when I pointed that out to me, it was very amazing. If you think about it, there, there's no alleyway in Prominent Prominent Garden, there's no alleyway in, in, um, in the Independence Park. And so all the water has to go somewhere. It just finds its way into his property and into the, eventually, and hopefully, into the Lamar Street Canal. Right. I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Thanks. And with regards to the white paint, painting the houses and the trees, white, does anyone know yeah. that answer to that question? I think I, I like to guess an answer. I think white reflects heat. So most houses are painted in white and they, they reflect the heat from the tropical sunlight, you know? Mm, okay. And, and I'm interested in the, the other half of your question. Why do you paint the bottom half of these trees? That is because they want to keep tall. Might so they paint it with some kind of lime, or some um, kind of lime, 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 ash. Quick lime. I don't know why they do it. I think it's it enables to grow to the tree itself, but I don't know. Okay. Well, I, I want to offer um, my thoughts on resources for finding out um, the sort of origins of these properties. I think a good source I found is the British Ghana Official Gazette, uh, which are kind of hard to come by. But uh, from my own uh, archives, um, I think they start around at least the ones that. Um, I've been able to lay my hands on. Uh, they start pretty early, like around 1900. And I think I have seen uh, the ones that go to the 1920s. Um, yeah, 1902 to 1917, sorry. So those are available and they carry, um, you know, all kinds of notices, mortgages and, and transports, and some are searchable. So if you can get your hands on those, um, those are a good source. Of course, you know, the buildings, there, there isn't much on what was actually on the site. If you kind of see who owned the property um, up to that time and when, I also know that there was a project to digitize the, um, the land registry and it was supposed to be made available online. Um, I don't know how far that has progressed, but um, you know, in addition, of course, to the plans at the um, Lands and Surveys Department, I think it's, it's sort of you triangulate between the three or among the three. Um, because, for example, we were talking about state house, government house. I think the colonial engineers' reports, um, the ones I've seen starting around eighteen nineties, um, you know, the government was responsible for maintaining that property. So pretty much, if you look at the um, colonial engineers' reports starting around the eighteen nineties. Um, you can you can see the changes that have been made. There, there's not there's not much talk of the origins of it, but you can see the changes. You know this has been repaired. This has been added. Um, you know there were problems with termites. You pretty much can walk through the history of government government house up to that period. Um, Wayne and I I think Wayne and I were were um, looking at that. So the colonial engineers reports for government owned properties, um, the British Guyana official gazettes for sundry items. Of course, you'd have to kind of know 
either what lot you're looking for in what ward, or you'd have to know the name of the owner. But it's a rich on mind um, database. And it, of course, it covers the entire uh, spread of Guyana. Oh, so you're sorry. looking for your relatives as well. I was able to find what I believe is my great, great grandmother, um, uh, her family, um, buying up land like crazy on the Pomeroon River um, in the early 20th century. So it's those are amazing sources if you could if you could get your hands on them. But there are lots of, that that are actually missing. Um, that you know, and the earlier ones prior to 1902, I have not seen. Alison, can I also mention the blue books? Uh -huh. The statistical ones, which actually go back to the 19th century, and they do give the official reports because they actually contain the contract taxes. <laughs> And um, I'm not sure what they're in there. <laughs> the cube. I think even the uh, University of London got copies here going back to the 1890s. And they give quite detailed studies for the, for the public buildings, all the debates about where it's on the contracts, et cetera. So that's another source in addition to the sets. Yeah. Okay, Elfrida's been waiting very patiently for your question. So Hi, Elfrida. I invite her to uh, do so. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. Is it, can you all hear me and see me? Yes. yes. Um, special hello, of course, to Wayne. Thank you for your this latest effort to present information on our beloved, uh, the records of our beloved city and country, and also, of course, the Bird Carter. And before I forget, let me say what I think I may have said before. Somebody needs to sit down with Bert with a microphone and a tape recorder and have a conversation with him, you know, a relaxed conversation and have him clearly and to take his time and however long it takes, let him record all that he, all that you know, Bert, <laughs> particularly mm -hmm. to do with the culture of doing a thorough job as an engineer, <laughs> because it seems to me we don't have too many of that class of person around these days, let me be blunt, um, to be serious because the fact that you are now, I have to thank you for hearing about canal number three, which I never heard of before. We all know about canal one and canal two. Now we're hearing about canal number three. I haven't heard anybody mention that before. So you have a, you have a, you know, a wealth of knowledge, which you usually share in this kind of incidental way, which is really fascinating. I believe it's just maybe being recorded. So that is something, but seriously, um, I have a lot of little points as I, I've been scribbling as I've heard people. For example, most recently, um, Alison Stull was talking about records and the things being a rich source. But are you where? Where are these records? Because are they? Are you saying they're in Guyana? Are you saying you? you say uh, I would. I would say mostly outside of Guyana. Um, there is where a very these rich be? source. Uh, if you've heard of the Hattie Trust Library. Um, let me put the uh, the link up for everyone. No, I'm um, yeah, I'm just saying things like that need to be done just as a matter of sharing the basic information because even even when you have, we all know you can have 10 pages of reference links. It's still going to take a handful of people who are very dedicated and very focused to start to do research. And even when they do research, you have to have that you know, you have to have that imagination to pull things together and really begin to do the significant work as relating as it relates to the history of this country and particularly the built heritage. Uh, I mean, it, there is so much to do. And what we need is to have a very open sharing of basic sources, whatever country they're in, so that people can, can at least have a sense of what they may be able to plan to do. Um, you know, for example, uh, Wayne was saying, just now, of course, he can't be in Guyana, and I know he's tried before to do a lot of things here. But there's also the source of presumably the Great British Museum, though I'm not sure what the range of, of documentation is on Guyana or other former colonies these days. Um, whether one can actually, for example, go to some part of the British Museum and Wayne, ask, would you like and, to, to, and ask to see British Guyana official gazettes, for example, maybe, maybe not. But you know, so there's things like that people need to um, maybe find out about. Elfrida, I, I totally get you, but I, am, I, I share freely. If you wanna know something, people write to me and they ask. 
But sometimes I think I'm overloading people. Like you ask me for something about your X, Y, Z. And then I give you all this stuff. And, mm-hmm. and there are people I never hear from again. Because I think I've overloaded you. I mean, I know how I, my research is and how caught up I get when I'm doing something. So I'm hesitant. But I think everyone, I, at least I see the ones represented here. If you want to know something about Guyana, um, you can ask Alison. Maybe she'll she'll give you an answer or she'll tell you where you can look. But I'm kind of, you know, unless it's like on Wayne's site, where Wayne knows I can go crazy. I like post a bunch of stuff for months, for weeks, and then I would be like, oh my God, I, I may have overloaded everyone and they're not interested in this stuff the way uh, I am. May, yeah, may I just say, I just got to, I don't think you can ever do too much. Uh, I don't think you seriously, very serious. I don't think you can ever do too much, but I can understand if people are just focusing on you only, which is why it's useful if you can share stuff maybe with Wayne, who has done such an amazing job with his um, wooden heritage of Ghana, which architecture of Ghana rather, which is sort of grown and so on and so on. Either that or a link with the University of Ghana history department um, I'm, not, um, I'm not sure if anybody can hear what just passed my host. Um, I'd like to, I, no, I'd like, yeah. right, I'd like to get to that in a minute because that to me is the reason we should be here today. Okay, to Elfrida, I've George actually Stone. got some other questions. So if you just um, want it, to give, give us one final thing and then I need to, we have a few others waiting. Well, that's typical because I really have always a lot to say, but people really don't want to hear what I have to say if I can put it that way. Um, the point is, um, if, for example, the, the Department of History at UG can be maybe the focal point where material like this is. And in fact, young historians, because I remember even in the days of the Heritage Society, I used to say, where are the young historians? We have to have them come in <laughs> to do some of the research for the Heritage Society. Um, and if I can say, make my final point, we were talking just now about things like drains and styrofoam and so on and cluttering the drains. The, the, the serious point we have to deal with, we all have to deal with in some way here, is what are we doing about the appalling state of Georgetown? I'm living on a main street, which years ago used to be a residential street and which is now a wreck, including where I am living. Noise, filth, rubbish, literally outside my gate, which has nothing to do with me. I play my part foolishly by actually paying to have the carpets cut and I've been doing it for 20 odd years, which the council should be doing. And despite everything, you have messes everywhere, you have chaos everywhere. And as many of you know, there's recently been a wonderful scheme to put a car park in the area right where I live. So cars can park. And people have made a couple of comments and some nice letters in the press and so on. One man said, what about that Jubilee Park near to the near to the St. General by the, the San Jose Tree Monument? Um, you know, and yet a couple of people have said things. I, um, I should okay, really write I, something. I understand your frustrations, and no, but this is why. This is why. Why are we here? Um, when is Wayne's topic was Georgetown? But are we going to only focus on what Georgetown used to be? We have to deal with what is Georgetown like we now. Do, but there are. And other- I say this. May I just say this? I'm say, I'm I'm passionate about this because I live here. I live here, like maybe some other of you here. We live okay. here. Thank you. So Thank we you have to decide that. what are we doing to make a change and speak. Uh, to- we'll, we'll come back. I, I, I think yeah. I, I can, I, you know, I'll, I'll offer some suggestions, at least. Great. I, I said I left Guyana in, in 2017, most recently. I kept, I keep leaving and, and, and coming back inevitably. Um, and I've, I've been there recently and I, I figure, you know, if you want to get involved, then you should. I would present myself at City Hall right now and say, you know, why is this building um, in this condition? You guys inhabit this building day to day. Let's have a committee for City Hall. And I think Carlton Jong raised this about his involvement with um, with the uh, St. George's Cathedral. You just have to get involved. It's enough talk. Step forward and let me form a committee if I'm interested in this. Let's see where it goes. Somebody, some, you know, some of the youngsters would take it up. Um, UG's Eco Trust Society might be interested. We got to try something, you yeah. know. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move us along a little bit. We have two questions pending. Yeah. 
Uh, one from Facebook, which uh, I'm going to ask Bert to handle and fairly swiftly, uh, from Carl Anderson. Why, when this, the rain falls, does the city flood? Bert, you got one minute <laughs> on this because I know I know you've given extensive lectures on this, so we, maybe we can just direct uh, this young man to those. But the, 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 the two reasons the city can flood: one, if the tide is high and the rain is falling during the high tide period, then it means the caucus can't be opened because it means water would actually come in and invade the land. So there's one possibility. And generally, you find that rain falls heavily in the night, in the forty, forty morning, as we say. There's invariably when most schools seem to be closed. Anyway, truth is, the city floods because we have not, we have allowed the culture of maintenance to disappear altogether. We don't maintain anything these days. You know, this is my personal view. I think if we maintain things a little bit more sincerely, we would have less flooding. I just want to make a quick point on what Susan raised about the trees. Now, one of the things I found out of late is that. In the early part of the city, the late 20th century and the early 19th century, you had to plant fruit trees because fruit trees were seen as fire barriers. <clears throat> right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, if oh, you have okay. to plant a tree, you might as well plant one that you can reap something from it, you know? Okay. Well, that, that makes sense why they use star apple, as Wayne had said, star apple and breadfruit. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question pending, um, and then we're going to start to wrap up unless there are any more. Um, Ronald, you've been waiting very patiently. Would you like to go ahead? You may have, I don't know if you're, 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 uh, your tag is Ronald. You may not be Ronald, but you've got- Sorry, 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 hello? Sorry, yes. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, this is actually a question from Mr. Wayne. I don't know if um he can um have any insights in this. At Ivleri, plantation Ivleri, I heard I read in before that it was actually a coffee plantation. I'm not sure, but there are two structures there, two um well brick structures. I was told it was the armory, but I would like to know if it's actually an armory and also if it was built by the British or the Dutch, because the way how the bricks was laid is similar to Fort Island, the structures in Fort Island. And I have another question too, what was the purpose, what was the actual purpose of the jetties in Kingston? Ronald, if I can answer the question briefly about those structures. I'm not quite sure myself really, there's a debate as to whether they were built by the Dutch. And I'm sure somebody there would be able to answer the question directly. I mean, the brickwork obviously suggests something much older than they're meant to be by the British, but can somebody actually elaborate on that? I think they could be older than they are, but probably they date more from the British period during the World, World Wars. Thank you. I, I, I don't know, maybe I could shape any of our opinion. I don't know if it's a fact, but I could offer an opinion. I think they were built by the British and used as armories, both the one and what well, used to be part pre dam one right to the head of Cap Street, it means the Seawall Road. And that one that's mm -hmm. supposed to be in the compound of the Bleary. I think they use armaments. They destroyed a lot of the armory, you know? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, my research tells me that that is, uh, that is, that is correct. Um, they were British uh, and they were used for, you know, storing gunpowder and, and other kinds of ammunition. Ordnance storehouse. Um, mm. and, and I'm not surprised if, if the uh, if the brickwork is is, is Dutch or Flemish, uh, because you remember who who was actually building that stuff enslaved people. So um, they would have had the tradition. You remember we we're talking about um, the early 19th century. If they were the builders actually doing the work, following a plan, uh, maybe British they would have actually been using techniques that they had learned over years. So you're not gonna switch from building in a Dutch um, style to British just because you changed forests. The people still have those memories, those building traditions that they, they adhere to. Okay. So I think we, we speak of, oh, Sycamore built the sea wall, uh, Sycamore designed it, but who were the actual nuts and bolts, the sweat equity on the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. and, then, and the question with the jetty, Kingston. Well, most most jetties serve the purpose of accretion. 
And I was if you look at if you look at the whole sea world that go out into the Atlantic Ocean, on the eastern side of the world is the Uterine accretion, on the other side is a diminution of, of, of seashells and sand, you know. And I think that, that helps to control the build-up of the sand and the and the foreshore. I think the ground itself, I don't know, but I do know that there's a pipe that, that goes through right there, carries the sewage to George Strong. <laughs> the sewage George mm-hmm. Strong used to go under that jelly into the ocean. I know if it went far enough to where it and the way it still could have gone out some further. But the truth is that's what it's intended to do. I don't think it's intended to, to keep any sand away. But the, the, the sewer for Josh Strong right now it doesn't go anywhere near it. It's dumped straight into the river. Oh, wow. Oh, dear. Thank you, Mr. Bird. I'm Mr. Wayne. And but um, just to add to that, all the jetties were built because of longshore drift. If you look at the waves coming in, you see they're coming at an angle. If you didn't have jetties, everything would end up in the river and clog the river. You have to unwind that jetty is usually built up very high, and the other side is very low. Hello. Just to Thank stop you very the much. sand going along the coast into the river. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think those are our questions, and we have actually now been uh, dealing with questions for quite a long time. Um, unless anyone has anything final, I'd just like to invite uh, Wayne, uh, if he has any closing remarks, um, or uh, if um, Bert or Alison would like to add anything. At the, um... um, going back to the sources, can I say publicly a plea to the people in Ghana? I'm naming the National, well, the National Trust, I think, are doing a good job now, generally. There's the University of Guyana. There's the public library system, there are the archives, and there's the museum. And they have let Guyana down for the last 50 years. Okay. okay. Do I, I have a question with regards to that? I thought you finished. I did ask the question in the chat for, for Alison, where can we get hold of the Gazette? So you just sort of triggered that question again. <laughs> um, yeah. You're referring to the Gazette, Alison, but I, you didn't say where can we get hold of one for information? Because you gave uh, me some quite a few years ago. Oh, I did. Oh, see, I've, I've forgotten that. Yeah, uh, I have a couple. They're pretty large files. I can I can send the ones I have to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I said, uh, I got mine via Cornell. Um, A.D. White, one of the founders of Cornell, was actually a commission on the British Guyana Venezuela Boundary Commission in the 1890s. Okay. So I remember getting there in 2003 and I was, um, you know, given uh, an apartment in a house that he had lived in. And I'm looking up on the wall as I'm sitting in the living room and there is A.D. White and um, a document on the British Guyana Venezuela Boundary Commission. And I'm swamped. Here am I, this unknown, you know, unknowing student from Guyana. And here am I landing in, in, the, in a house, a, a historic home um, on, uh, that A.D. White had actually, he had something to do with it. And then I discovered his, his extensive um, collection in Cornell's archives. They have all kinds of maps and it's a treasure trove there. Uh, so that was one of my early sources. And a lot of stuff Google has online, you know, has been digitized. Um, and is online. So those are available. But uh, usually I, I, I've shared a lot on Wayne's um, wooden heritage, wooden architectural heritage. If you go to the file section, um, we share files or I, I post, other people do to post stuff there. Um, I'm on that know, Facebook page. Yeah, if you go to the file section, there are a lot of PDFs there. Um, I find maps uh carry a lot of information on for example if you look at the the seven the maps from of georgetown the city of uh you know of demerara let's say because of course georgetown came much later if you look at the uh maps and plans of the mouth of the demerara from the 1780s 
you'll find a lot of information on the canals that were there or proposed. Um, you'll find who owned what. You'll see a kind of um, you'll see the kind of infrastructure that really underpins Georgetown, that plantation, um, you know, sectioning that really underpins our city. So maps. Um, do not neglect maps in the marginalia of maps. They carry a lot of stuff. And they also point you in the direction of other sources as well. Okay, because I was asking particularly about the Gazette, because you had mentioned the Gazette as being a very informative source. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, so you're referring to the Gazette. I can also get that in the PDFs that you referred to? Yes, the British, okay. uh, the official Gazette of British Guyana. Um, okay. From about 1902 to 1917, there are a couple missing um, in my own collection. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Thank you. Those are those are excellent. Okay. Blue books, one. administrative reports, annual administrative reports. The British were excellent record keepers, of, as you said um, quite correctly. So if you have a hankering for that sort of thing, um, I can overload you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, thanks, I do. One final question from a Judith, and then that's that's going to be our closing question. Thank you. Um, mine is going to be a very quick question, maybe just a, an observation. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, inform this meeting that I think that the Caribbean Research Library at the University of Ghana Library is another very excellent source. I worked there many years ago. And um, maybe it's a well-hidden secret that that is one of the largest, if not best collection on Guyanese historical material. And they have an excellent collection of maps. I hope they still have them, um, but they have a very, very good collection of maps. And, and those maps were also used some years ago in relation to the Guyana-Venezuela for the, for the um, dispute. Uh, so just to say that in terms of sources in Guyana, um, the Caribbean research section of the University of Guyana Library is I see, feel a very important collection um, within Guyana, but maybe it's not, um, you know, they've been going through some rough times in relation to being able to buy material and so on, but in terms of historical material, I know that they had many years ago and I hope they continue to have a very good and important collection on Guyanese history. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, may I be allowed to say one last comment, uh, if that's if, uh, when I'm gonna say it, if it doesn't depend anybody. I just wanted to reiterate what Bert had said before, which is that there is no culture of maintenance. There is no culture of maintenance. And this is the ugly truth. Um, Wayne is just making some comments which have, would make people uncomfortable about how we've been let down. And unless we deal with the, the ugly truth of the present and really sit, put our heads together and say, how are we solving it? Instead of just going, oh, you know, and so on. Um, again, to give, use the example of the, what is now called the mall, and my family was just always called the Avenue because my grandparents' house was further up on Church Street. And since my mother was a little girl, they, they played on the Avenue, so we all call it Avenue. I said in the, the 80s, wrong time I came back to Guyana, after a while I saw a lot of concrete little areas for kids to play, skateboard, that was fine and so on. But, and then they put little shops in concrete for people to vend in the middle of that beautiful stretch of grass and, and breeze and old trees that we used to have. And I just said, you know, when the council has any problem or anything, their solution is cover it with concrete. And the simple job, you can almost call it unskilled, of keeping the mall cut, the grass cut, for the last five plus years. They have not even done that. So I have sat here and seen the grass grow like rice fields. I've seen the grass grow in the trenches as if it's rice fields. And the same city council, which is now talking about, oh, let's bring order to this area so we're going to make a car park. Maybe it's an abomination, worse than an abomination. And this is the council, which is actually, as far as I'm aware, maybe I'll be corrected, is, are they meant to be the stewards of Georgetown? Somebody even wrote a letter, I think it was in the staff of Jews, and the lady said, quite good letter. Then she said at one point, oh, no, that area is owned by the council. Well, again, I don't have the time or inclination to pick up and write the letter every but all the number of things I would like to comment on, though I really have to do something very soon. Okay. Um, they don't own anything. They don't own anything, there's chores. And Bert is right. How do we maintain the city? We can talk about all the beauty that was there before. But of course, 
as uh, I think uh, Isabel de Gris was saying, or somebody else, we, those of us who live here, you know, we're the ones who chose to live here. Uh, we will have to do something about it. But we, that is what I think we need to have a discussion about. So whether it's on Zoom, where we all are distanced, or whether it, we decide, those of us in Georgetown, to come together and, and seriously show a commitment um, to make something different. Um, we are just going to be going down the road, as uh, I think even we and other people said. I've been talking for, for years that we should really have started talking about moving the capital of Georgetown since the 70s, but there was no money for that. I agree. There was no we're money for that. that. We're going to have to. We're going to have. Oh, to certainly. Work. Thank you very much for being so patient and allowing me to speak. I do appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. And All thanks right. to Wayne and, and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Wayne, for Thank you. as well Thank you. for uh, this evening's um, discussion. Um, for those who enjoyed it, there will be um, uh, another one in two weeks' time. Um, and I think at that point, Wayne's going to be talking about Georgetown's great houses um, or a, a selection uh, thereof. Um, so do look out for it and do join us again if, uh, if that's of interest. Um, thank you all for, um, for joining us this evening. And thank you also to those on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you to Joan for assisting behind the scenes and we look forward to seeing you um, in a couple of weeks for the next talk and discussion. Um, but thanks very much. It's been very interesting and very informative. Thanks particularly to Wayne and to Alison and to Bert for their um, assistance. Oh, so you. before we go, um, I, I, I'm very interested in the, the, the Elfrida's com uh, suggestion that, that we take Bert in hand. <laughs> Bert, we have to take you in hand. We have okay. lost I'm uh, the, uh, the Sir Alpop. And I, I remember talking with him and I know he told me he was 